And out there at Tabernacle, there was a church called Tabernacle Baptist Church. And it was just an old-time gospel preaching Baptist church. And the folks from Bob Jones go down there, and they didn't, know, <laughs> they didn't really know how to act when they got down to Tabernacle. It was a little bit different and, and <laughs> for them, anyway. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember old uh, Dr. Trachin. If you have your Bibles, uh, Revelation chapter 3. One night we went down to a camp meeting in Rosaka, Georgia. We were going to seminary down at Tennessee Temple. And they had a camp meeting down at uh, Sammy Allen's place in Rosaka, Georgia. So we thought we'd go in and take up, take up in the camp meeting. So we went down there and, and we uh, heard Dr. Johnny Pope preach and had a great time. We came back and we were telling them the next morning in the gathering about, uh, about being down there at uh, the camp meeting. And they said, surely you didn't go. Said, yeah, we went down there. And Mrs. Trachin, who was the president of the seminary's wife, she said, I used to go to a Shouting Baptist church. And she said, uh, I said, you did? She said, yeah, my preacher always preached seven points. And I said, he did. And, and she said, yeah, Dr. Harold Seitler. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard Dr. Seitler preach, but the best way to describe Dr. Seitler is he's a spirit-filled preacher. Amen. <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah. He said, I was in church one time, and he said, uh, he said I told Polly, they said, a guy come running straight down the pew at us. And I told, I told Polly, which was Mrs. Trake, and he said, where are we going to go now? <laughs> but anyway, the, Dr. Seitler, the old boys from down, uh, Bob Jones used to come to Tabernacle, and they'd come down, they'd have altar prayer, and they'd never seen that before. And he said, he said, I'll tell you boys something. He said, this church was built on altar prayer. And he'd, he'd give them a good schooling on altar prayer. Now, now there's something special about it, Amen. Something special when we, you know, I, I think every time I hear people praying together aloud, I think about the verse over it says, and they lifted their voice as the voice of one man, you know. Uh, when our prayers go up, when we agree in prayer uh, and we come together in one accord, it's just like the prayer of one man. And, and I, I appreciate the, I appreciate good old-fashioned altar prayer. I, it does something to me when we all get together, gather around the altar and begin to pray. And I, I think God, I th the Bible says where two would agree on earth is touching any one thing. It shall be done. We need to agree in prayer. Amen. And so uh, Revelation chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, I, I hope you had a good uh, Christmas holiday. We've already been together once on Christmas. and Now the last, as uh, Brother Paul's already said, it's our last service in 2011. Uh, we come together here on Wednesday night, perhaps, for the last time this year. Looking forward to a, a new year as we come together again and the possibilities that a new year brings. But let's look at the verse 14, if you have your Bible. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. We'll finish our study tonight on the seven churches. And it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. As uh, many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I'll stand at the door, and, uh, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in unto him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to uh, sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, for just a little while tonight, we're going to look at the church of Laodicea. Let's just pray before we get started tonight and ask God to bless the study. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. Thank you for all that you give me. And uh, Lord, I, I, I'm just so thankful to be in this place tonight because I sense your presence. So good to come to church, to come to this place and gather together in fellowship and to feel and to sense the presence of the Lord. When your spirit bears witness with our spirit and we realize that we're, that we're sons of God and, Lord, that you're in this place. Now, Father, I ask you that you would be with me and help me, God, that I might be a blessing. I pray, God, that you'd help us as a church that we'd never be a lukewarm church. God, that we'd be what you'd have us to be. 
God, set us on fire for you. Help our witness to burn brightly. God, we love you and thank you and praise you for all that you've done in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for the past several weeks now, we've looked at what we call a study we call the complete church. And we did that because of the number seven, seven churches, seven's the number of completion. But I also believe that the complete church is a spirit-filled church. As I studied these verses, one of the things that came out, and if I ever do it again someday, somewhere, I'm going to call it seven characteristics of a spirit-filled church. Because in every instance it says, let the, it's him that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And so as you look at that, I believe that the complete church is a spirit-filled church. Now, I want to look at, and I want to give you, I'll sum it up tonight, and I'll give you the last characteristic, but as we came through, we learned about seven characteristics. Number one, we saw the church at Ephesus that teaches us that the complete church is not, is not loveless. And number two, the church at Smyrna teaches us that the complete church is, not, is, is loyal. Uh, number three, the uh, church at Pergamos teach, taught us that the uh, complete church is not lax. And uh, that was doctrinally lax. And number four, the church at Thyatira teaches us that the complete church is not liberal. Uh, number five, the church at Sardis teaches us that the complete church is, is not lifeless. Number six, the church at Philadelphia teaches us that the complete church is not limited. That uh, behold, I set before you an open door. And I open and no man can shut and I shut and no man can open. Now tonight I'm going to look at the church at Laodicea and we're going to learn tonight that the complete church, the spirit-filled church, is not lukewarm. And so uh, I, I want to look tonight at the church at Laodicea. Now when you look at the church at Laodicea, I want to begin tonight, this is the way I began every study and, and progress, but let's begin tonight by considering, if you will, the city. You have to realize now that as we study through these cities that there are seven literal cities that existed in the days of John in the province of Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. There were over a hundred churches that existed at, at, at that time, but he chose out of that hundred only seven. If you study them in any way, if you study them geographically, you'll find that they make an arc. They go upward and then back, excuse me, they go upward this way and then back down and they complete. But uh, they, they, so let's look at it, if you will, number one, at the city. Geographically, they're located 40 miles southeast of the city of Philadelphia and due east of the city of Ephesus. And the, the city of Laodicea was close to two other cities, Colossae and Hierapolis. Now, you're going to find that Paul speaks of the, the church of, of Laodicea and those that are in Laodicea. In the book of, in the epistle of the Colossians, uh, he mentions them uh, about three or four times. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, uh, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them uh, at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. In chapter 4, he says, uh, he, he goes in and he says in verse 13, uh, For I, I bear him record, talking about Epaphras, he says, I bear him record that he hath great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. In, chapter, in verse 15 he says, salute the brethren uh, which are in Laodicea. And in verse 16 he says, that, uh, and uh, when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read among also the church of Laodicea and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And so he speaks of the church at Laodicea over and over again. And they're located uh, close geographically, those three cities. But not only are they located close, or did they have a close lo uh, proximity of one another, but uh, the cities were closely related in Christian fellowship. He said, you take the letter from Colossae over there and let the Laodiceans read it, and then take the one from uh, Laodicea and let the folks that are in Colossae read it. And so uh, they were closely related in Christian fellowship. Historically, the city uh, was founded by Antiochus II, and it was named after his wife, Laodicea. Now, that's a, that's a strange name for a woman, but uh, I, 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 as I studied today, I found out that in that time it was a common name for people of that time. Economically, the city of, La the city of uh, Laodicea was famous for the manufacture of woolen garments, especially uh, the black glossy uh, woolen garment. 
And, and it was also uh, known for the ISAV uh, that was manufactured there in the city. It was a center, city of, uh, excuse me, a banking center, and it possessed uh, immense wealth. And so that's a little bit of the facts about the city of Laodicea. Their counselor is introduced for us in, in, the, in the epistle. You'll notice that he says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. Now when he says the amen, he's talking about the confirmer. Now I say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, the word amen means so be it. Do you mean, you realize that, you know, we come into our church and my, my a sister was here with the, with her daughter and, and about five other young ladies. And she said, uh, when everybody got started saying amen at the Christmas program, she said, I didn't know some of those girls had never been to church. <laughs> and she said, I wanted to find out that they were all right. And so one of them, said, she said to the, to the young lady, she said, are you okay? She said, it was fine with me. I didn't mind it. She said, but she said, when folks started shouting and saying amen, she said, I thought it might disturb them just a little bit. Let me, do you realize that when you say amen, what you're saying is so be it. When the preacher preaches and he says something, you, you're saying, so be it. Now, when you say, so be it, you, realize, you have to realize that uh, when they used that, uh, that term in the day, it took the force almost of an oath. It wasn't an oath. But it confirmed, it, it, it uh, binded, and it sealed pledges. And so uh, you're saying, the preacher says something, and you say, amen, you're saying, so be it. You say, I confirm that. And here, uh, the Lord pictures himself as the confirmer of all truth. He said, I am the amen, and, and he said, the faithful and true witness. And so, and, and, and he's talking about, uh, he is the confirmer of all truth. But not only that, he says, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, when you look at that, and he said, and the word beginning there means the source or the origin. It's the word RK. And, and, and Christ is not part of God's creation. He's the fountainhead of all creation. You know, when you think about it, uh, he's not, some people have Christ as a part of the creation of God. When he says he's the beginning of the creation of God, it means he's the fountainhead of all creation. Preacher, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying, and without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Bible says that uh, the world was made by him. Do you realize that everything around you was made uh, and Je uh, by him? Jesus Christ was, uh, took part in the creation. He's the beginning of the creation of God. And so as he introduces himself, he says, I'm the confirmer of the truth. I'm the amen, the faithful and true witness. And I'm, and I'm the fountainhead of creation. I'm the creator. And he introduces himself uh, to the church of Laodicea. Now, if you look at, you'll find that, uh, if you look at the commendation, you'll find that he has not one good thing to say about the Laodiceans. There are two churches that we, in the seven, that he had not one bad thing to say about. The, the beginning was the church at Smyrna. Nothing's bad to say about them. Not one negative word. And, and, they, and last week we studied, or not last week, but the week before last, we studied the church at Philadelphia. Not one, not one negative word. But you're going to find as you study the church of Laodicea that he has not one thing to commend them for, nothing good to say about the church but he has much to say about their condition. So let's look, if you will, at their condition. Now, I want you to notice, if you have your Bibles, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Now, I want to I just stop there for a moment, and I'll go on, but he says, I would that thou art cold or hot. Now, here's the condition in verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now when you look at that, and he talks about the church of Laodicea, he gives their condition in verse 16. <coughs> he says, you're lukewarm. Now, could I say that the church of Laodicea, what does it mean to be lukewarm? Well, the church at Laodicea had become complacent. And they become comfortable. <laughs> Do you remember me saying, if you ever get to the place where you get satisfied, you're done? Well, that's exactly how it started in Laodicea. They come to the place where they'd gotten satisfied, they'd gotten complacent, they'd gotten comfortable with the way things were, and so uh, it, 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 lukewarmness had settled in. Well, how does the church go from being on fire for God 
By the way, I believe they were once on fire for God because you find the Apostle Paul mentioning them over and over again in the, in the uh, letter to the Colossians. He says, even though, he said, I even want you to read the letter that came to them. You read that and you send the letter you got to them. And, he, and he, over and over he said, the church of Laodicea, the church of Laodicea. And so when you look at that, you have to remember that here was a church that was on one, at one time held in high regard by other churches and by other Christians and even great Christians like the Apostle Paul. But how did they go from being a church on fire to a church that's lukewarm? Now, you'll notice that he says this. Number one, he says they were not hot. They weren't on, they weren't on fire. And they were not cold, or, and I would say, if I say cold, they were not dead. They were stuck somewhere in the middle. Now you realize, he said, I wish you were over here, hot. Or I wish you were cold, but you're not. You're somewhere in the middle, lukewarm. Now there's a reason for that, and I'm not going to get into all the pictures there, but I want to give you the, I want to give the practical. But they were stuck, now... Can I say this to you? And I say it, I say it with all respect because we're all in the same boat. I believe that more Christians suffer from lukewarmness than any other thing. Amen. I believe that more Christians suffer from being lukewarm than want to admit it. You say, preacher, how do you get there? Listen to me. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. You see, in the Bible, there's three spiritual temperatures. Now, notice, if you will, number one, there's a burning heart on fire for God. You remember when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? And, the Bible, and they, he appeared to them, and they didn't really realize who it was. But he started at Moses and all the prophets, and, and he, reve- he opened up the word and, and told them the things concerning himself. And the disciples had one thing to say, those two on the road to Damascus, did not our hearts burn within us? And you know, uh, and, and number one, the first spiritual temperature is that person who has a burning heart, who's on fire for God. And, you know, that, now I'm going to tell you, ideally, that's where I want to be. But number two, there's a cold heart. Uh, Matthew 24, 12 talks about that. It says, and because of, uh, and because of iniquity, shall, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now there's a cold heart. There's a warm heart. Excuse me, there's a, there's a, a heart on fire for God. And then there's a cold heart. But then the third condition is lukewarm. You find that in, the, in our text. And when he says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth, what he's saying is, lukewarm Christians, are you you listening? Make me sick. (laughs) Now, I didn't write it. I'm just reporting it, all right? He, he, you know, it's just like, I don't want, you know, (laughs) you know, really lukewarm stuff's not good. You go, in, you go into a, a restaurant and you get coffee. Why do you think the waitress comes around and she said, can I warm that up for you? She doesn't want you to drink it lukewarm. And, and most people don't like, most people like things hot or they like things cold. And by the way, if you're me, I just like cold things. I don't like anything hot. <laughs> and uh, I don't drink coffee and I, I very seldom drink hot chocolate. But anyhow, and if it's hot, I, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, he says, you're lukewarm. So the three conditions. Now, the lukewarm heart, let me say it again, is comfortable, it's complacent, and it doesn't realize its need. If if you were at least cold, you'd feel it. Now, now the cold water of Colossae and the hot water from Hyopolis were lukewarm by the time they made it to Laodicea. And and let me give you, if you will, let me talk to you about how do you get in that condition. Are you listening? Now, notice it's it's kind of funny. Well, why did Jesus say, I would that you were hot, or cold. Now, most of us would say, well, I can see why he would say that I wish you were, you were hot, but why would he say I would that you were cold? Let me give you number one. Number one, are you listening? Because inwardly, a lukewarm person has no sense of need. No sense of need. Say, preacher, what do you mean? Because they're lukewarm. Uh, he said, I would rather you were cold 
Well, <laughs> why? Well, uh, you see, it's easier to revive an old cold heart than it is a lukewarm one, amen? <laughs> you know, most people have enough Christianity to ease their conscience and, and, and to steal uh, their fear of judgment. That's what they got. I mean, when they get in the place where they don't fear going to hell anymore and they say, well, I'm good enough, then that's about where they stay, amen? I know a lot of people that are like that. They, and, and they don't have enough to cause them to keep growing in the Lord and moving forward and getting closer to Him. Amen. I don't want to be like that. I'm going to tell you, I'm not where I want to be. I want to be closer to Him. Amen. I want to be more like Him, more like the Master I would ever be. And, and I want to be closer. To, but most people, when they get, they get in this lukewarm state and they say, well, I, 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 and they, you get up and you preach yourself blue in the face. They don't make a move. You know why? I'll tell you, there's one, there's one reason. Lukewarm. You say, well, preacher, that just didn't convict me. No, it probably didn't. <laughs> preacher, man, I thought, lukewarm. Lukewarm. They have no sense of need. And, and inwardly, there's no sense of need. But listen, let me give you something else. Outwardly, they have no enthusiasm. Preacher, wait. Well, here, listen to me. I would that you were hot. What does that mean? He said, I would you. You either be cold or hot. Don't get in the middle. I would that you were hot. Because in, when you're hot, you have enthusiasm. Now, by the way, there ought to be something that gets you excited. <laughs> Amen, preacher. I'm so excited I can't hold a whole bar. Enthusiasm. I mean, listen, I don't know. Hey, listen, if you can't get in, in, in excited or enthused about what's been going on around here, something's wrong with you. And, and, and uh, he said, I would that you were hot. When lukewarmness sets in, you never get excited about anything. You know, <laughs> well, well, I've been around here for years and I've seen it come and I've seen it go. <laughs> I know where it's headed. <laughs> Amen or old me, that's all I got to say. And that's, but that's what happens. You, don't, you, you can't get excited. And, and I know a lot of people that, you know, a guy told me one time that the word enthusiasm comes, it gets its root from the entheos, in God. And I believe if... Uh, I believe if you're stuck in the middle, you can't get excited about it. I, now, I'm going to tell you, I'm an excitable person. And I don't, I, I don't apologize for it. I let it out. Amen. I, <laughs> I've, been, I've been so, I, the devil told me a few times that them people never come back. You acted like a, you, act, you really showed yourself tonight. Amen. <laughs> hey, I, I'll tell you what, and, and, and my favorite saying is when it gets on, I like to get on with it. Amen. Hey, when it gets on in the choir, I get on with it. They, I mean, we had a choir in here one night, and man, they, it got on, and I got on with it. I was all over the place up here. Devil said, hey, you did it. And people never come back. Devil, you lost them. I mean, can I tell you something? Are you listening? They're members. Tonight, they're here. And, 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 and listen. There ought to be something that excites you. And when you get to the place where you're lukewarm, lukewarm people have no enthusiasm. They're not excited about serving God. They're not excited about growing. They're not excited about what He's doing. I'll tell you, if there ever was a time in the history of Big Bottom Missionary Baptist Church that folks ought to be excited and enthused, it's right now, amen. amen. I can tell you at least in the last 14 years, amen. amen. But let me, give you, let me give you some things that happen. Along the way, when people get lukewarm, number one, they lose their values. Notice they said, I'm, I'm rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. Now the church at Thur uh, Smyrna, Smyrna thought they were poor and they were really rich. And the church at Laodicea thought that they were rich and they were really poor. And they began to measure themselves by the standards of the world. I'm going to tell you, we cannot measure ourselves by the standards of the world. Amen. Hey, I, I thank God for, you know, what he's done here. But, but I'm going to tell you, when we, when we get more enthused about our assets and our architecture, our building, 
and our attendees than we are about him, something's wrong. Amen. Hey, and, and I'm going to tell you, I love what God's doing around here. But I'm gonna, I know when I'm in the wrong crowd. Because any time I get in a crowd when they, when they want to talk about their building or about the offering or about the doctors and the lawyers and the business people that go to their church and they can't get excited about Jesus, something's wrong. Amen. Thank God for everybody we got in here. And boy, I tell you, when you come here, we got a good cross-section of people. People that love God. But there's a problem when all that happens. And, and when you're sitting, and could I, I wrote this down in my notes, so I want to say it. This is not a business, amen? This is a church. Now, we don't need to be silly and stupid, but this is not a business. We can't run her by the pencil. We have, to, we have to run it and let the Spirit of God be our leader and let the Spirit of God be our guide and we cannot value and set everything up just like the world does because if we do, we're no better than the, 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 the grocery store down the road or the social club that meets down there on, the, on Canoa Boulevard. Amen. Amen. And so they, be, they begin to measure themselves by the standards of the world. And, and we can't let the world's values creep in. Not only did they have no values, they lost their values, but they lost their vision. The Laodiceans were blind. They couldn't see. Notice, notice what it says. Because thou sayest I'm rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind. Now, when they said that, the Laodiceans were blind. They couldn't, you know, we've already said that they couldn't see themselves as they really are, were. They said, we're rich. We're increased in goods. But, you see, they couldn't see themselves. They were blind and wretched and miserable. Why, why were they like that? Why couldn't they see them? They were lukewarm. They couldn't see themselves as they really were because they they'd lost their vision. And, and, but not only what, could they not see themselves as they really were, uh, they couldn't see others. They were blind to sinners. They couldn't see the needs of others. You know, there's a verse in the Bible, Proverbs 29, 18, it says where there's no vision, the people perish. Now, I, I don't know what your vision is for the, the future for this church. I know what mine is. But any vision that doesn't include the souls of men is not right. Amen. It, hey, it has to include. We're not, hey, we don't want to get big just so somebody can drive by and say, man, what a great church there. They got a lot of people. No, it's about the salvation of souls and people dying lost and going to hell on Camel's Creek and in Charleston about little kids who, who don't have a chance without somebody telling them about Jesus Christ. That's what this thing's all about, amen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that, uh, and, and we need to have a vision. And that vision has to be for, not only for of ourselves, but for the souls of men. They lost their vision. They lost their values. Not only that, but they lost their vigor. They got lukewarm. And they, they lost their vitality. And, but let me give you that they lost their vesture. Now, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to slow down right now. I want to help you just a little bit. You say vesture. What are you talking about, preacher? Notice what the Bible says that that they were poor and they were blind and they were naked. Now, when you look at that, don't you, don't you listen to me now, don't you accuse me of saying anything I didn't say, all right? Could I say to you there that when you look at that, he's go, you know, you're going to notice later he's going to try to correct that. He's going to give them a white raiment. But you're going to find as you study this book that over and over again it talks about, <coughs> <coughs> it talks about the white raiment, the white raiment, the white raiment. And a lot of people, when we study that, most of the time people say, well, that's speaking of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But do you realize that one of these days, when you attend the, the wedding supper, or, stay with me, I think you're going to get there with me. You're going to go in a white raiment, but the white is the righteousness of the saints. Do you realize that you're going to appear before at the wedding supper someday in a garment that was made by you. Preacher. All right, now, if you don't believe me, turn. So I got some of you all cranked up. So let's look at Revelation 19.8, all right?
Now, what he's trying to say to this church is, you don't have any righteousness. When he says you're naked, Revelation 19.8. By the way, now this is the second coming of the Lamb. It's about the marriage of the Lamb. Jesus come back on a white horse, and we're, the armies of heaven are following him. But notice what it says. Verse 7. Let's start on verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Look, look at this. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And by the way, if you look at that word righteousness there, it's the righteousnesses or the righteous acts of the saints. Now, I've heard people stand up and say all along, I don't have any righteousness. Well, positionally, you don't. You've got the righteousness of Christ. But I want to tell you something. There's positional righteousness, and then there's practical righteousness. That means that if, when you get saved, there's no excuse for you living an ungodly life. Amen. And someday when you appear before the judgment, a good friend of mine preaches a, <laughs> preaches a message called Naked at the Married Supper. And he talks about people that, have no, that, that live ungodly. Have no righteousness. And what he's saying in that verse when he says that, he's saying, he's saying you're naked. That means that, you're, that you, you're got, you have no garment. You have no righteousness. And he's looking at them and he's saying, you need to do something about that when he judges them. Now, he said, preacher, I never heard that before. Well, thank God for something you never heard before. Amen. But that's, what, that's the truth. And he says... You've lost your vesture. You lost your vision. You lost your, you lost your uh, vision. You've lost it. And he says you're lukewarm. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I never want to get in a place. I don't want Big Bottom Missionary Baptist Church to ever be a lukewarm church. Because if we ever get there, we're, we're mess, we're, if you start looking around saying, well, look at us, how great we are. $7,600 offering last Sunday. And boy, let me stop right there and say, thank God for that, amen. <laughs> but listen, that's not what it's all about. We can't measure ourselves by the standards of the world, amen. Let me give you something. Well, notice the council. Well, what does he tell them they ought to do? Let me get back to Revelation 3. Look at verse 18 now. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Now I'm going to stop right there and I'll give you the rest in a minute. Now number one, I believe when he talks about that, he's talking number one about their possessions. And I believe he's talking about for your values, you need gold that's been tried in the fire. And what he's saying is you need to choose the eternal, the lasting, over the material and the temporal. Amen. You need to choose something that's going to stick. Do you realize that the Bible says that one of these days we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? And by the way, this is when you're going to get your wedding garment. I'm right on target, all right? This is when you're going to get your wedding garment. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. And some of that stuff is going to be burned up, according to the Bible. You don't have to, you don't have to argue with me, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. It'll, the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is, wood, hay, and stubble. And by the way, if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned up, amen? But if it's uh, gold and precious stones, it'll, it'll stand the test of time. And if, if there's that kind of works in your life, when you get to the end of the way, and by the way, this is for stewardship, this is for service, not for salvation, you'll be rewarded for that, amen? And when he says, buy those things like gold tried in the fire, he's saying, put a value on those things that'll last. Do you realize that every material thing in this whole world will someday be burned up? It's not gonna last. Hey, only one life 
will soon be past. And only what's done for Christ will last. That's the only thing that's going to be there. When the fire tests it all, buy me gold. Try to, now you say, preacher, the Bible says buy. How can you say, are you saying we've got to work for our salvation? No, I'm not saying that. If you read Isaiah, you'll find it says, come to me and buy without money. Now wait a minute. Buy without money? You've got to appropriate it. The only thing that you have to realize to get this is to realize that you're poor and naked and blind. And if you come, he'll give it to you, all right? Uh, and so he says, I count you. Number one, come and get this gold. Try it in the fire. Think, hey, your value system needs to be changed. You need to get from material, value in material things to value in spiritual things, value in eternal things to value in, and not place so much value on material things because I want you to get those things that are going to last. Let me give you a second thing. Listen real close. But he says this. Look, notice the second part of the verse. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now when you talk about that, he's talking about their purity. And I got ahead of myself there, but you're going to find out he's, that over and over again he speaks of white raiment. He, you got your Bible real quick there. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. No, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Look at uh, verse 18. That's the one we just read. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire and white raiment. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and, and uh, upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Over and over it talks about white raiment, white raiment, white raiment. And listen, I want to tell you something. He's talking there about purity. He's talking about, uh, there about, uh, about personal righteousness. And he says, you need, that, you need that white raiment. But not only that, he says, for your vision. By the way, that's, uh, you'll, you'll find he says in, in the verse, he goes on to say in verse 18, he says, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. He said, you need something to take care of the problem you're having. You need to see yourself as you are. You need to see others as they are. And so he gives them counsel. He said, you need your vision restored. You need your vesture restored. You need your values restored. He said, and there's a way to get it. But let me give you the last thing I want to talk to you about tonight, the challenge. Go down to verse 20, if you will. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I know over the years I've heard that thing, I've heard that verse used over and over. And people say, and they use it all the time, he's, if he's knocking at your heart's door, let him in. I'm not going to say he's not doing that. But I want to give you this verse in its context. Are you listening? Here's a church that's lukewarm. Here's a church that has no sense of need. Here's a church that got to the place where they're not excited about anything. <laughs> and the picture's here. Jesus is standing on the outside knocking. Trying to get in. A lukewarm church is one that has Jesus shut out. He wants to get in. He said, listen, if you'll open up and let me in. He says, here's what I'll do. I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. I'll have supper with you. Now, if you study that thing about supper in the Bible and supper time, you'll find that's a blessed thing. Three meals of the day. I don't know if you're from the country. You understand this. Amen. There was breakfast, dinner, and supper. All right, breakfast was a light meal, uh, and usually at, 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 at dinner time in the Bible, it was just a, you know, a few things, but supper was the big meal of the day. Boy, when they came in, it was a time of rest and relaxation. People got, and it was, a, it was the biggest meal of the day. And he said, listen, I'll tell you what, if you come in, we'll have fellowship. If you open up and let me in, it's not too late. If you're lukewarm, all you got to do is open up and let me in. Since know that you have a need. Know that you're, uh, see, uh, get your eyes all cleared up and see that, uh, get some vision and see that you're, uh, see what you really are. And he said, I'll tell you what, you open the door and let me in and I'll come in. Amen. And I believe that's for any lukewarm church, by the way. And by the way, you remember that lukewarm churches are made up of lukewarm Christians. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the place where I'm lukewarm. 
because it's dangerous. It's better for you that you were hot or cold because when you get in the middle, you don't have any sense of need and you have no enthusiasm about the things of God. Hey, and so, number one, the challenge is open up the door entrance. Let me in. If you'll let me in, I'll come in. Hey, listen, I want to tell you something. I, you know, our church is growing. And uh, I know when you, have, when you grow, you have growing pains. But I never, are you listening? I never want us to get to the place where we are so programmed in our services that Jesus can't get in. Amen. Amen. Hey, come on. I've been in here when Jesus got in in a testimony service. I've been here when Jesus got in in an altar service. And I'm going to tell you if you ever get it to the place where people can't feel free coming to the altar or standing and exalting the Lord, you'll get Jesus locked on the outside. Amen. You, you, you ever wonder why so many? Listen, I was standing up here on Christmas Sunday and, and, and people, uh, people were testifying one by one, popping up everywhere. And next thing I knew, a whole bunch of people right here to my left were, were praying and gathered around the altar. I never want to get to the place where it's not possible for that to happen no matter how big we get. Amen. Hey, I, I, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I've told you this story before, but I think I'd just like to tell you again. Amen. I'll never forget one time we were on a contract strike and every time we got on that, I'd try to pick up a a job somewhere I couldn't I had to have I had to have some kind of income so I got a job at <laughs> I wasn't much of a carpenter but I got a job with, with another guy who was and we started building a house and there was a fellow in Montgomery his name was Herb Fields and he was a converted Jew and old brother Herb loved God man he'd come down there and he'd get to talking and we get started talking about Jesus. Before you know it, old Herb would be crying, tears dripping off his chin, and he'd be telling everybody how good God was and how much he loved Jesus. And he belonged to the downtown church. And it was so formal on Sunday morning that they pro that on Sunday morning they wrote in the bulletin the name of the person who was supposed to testify. And you weren't supposed to testify unless your name was in the bulletin. And old Herb would say, Bless God, I go down there, and he said, when God gets the blessing and, 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 and the Spirit gets the moving, he said, I'll tell you what I do. I don't, if my name's not written in the bulletin, he said, I just stand up and testify. He said, it makes them mad and shakes them up, but he said, I just do it anyway. And I want to tell you something. We, we, can't, we can't ever get there. And we, we have to have a place where Jesus can get in. Can't lock him out on the, ins, on the outside, because if we do, we're messed up. And so, number one, there's, he's challenging to open the door and let him in. <laughs> Say, preacher, what makes the Big Bottom different than any other church? I'll tell you what, Big Bottom's a church where the Spirit of God and the Lord Jesus Christ can still get in. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I always want to be that way. But notice the second thing. He, I'm going I'm to stop right here. You listen. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now you're going to notice that he promises, I'm going to exalt you. He said, I overcame and I'm, I've got a throne. I'm, and by the way, when you think about Jesus Christ, somebody talk about his ministry on earth, we think about all the things that he did while he was here, but have you ever talk, uh, thought about the post-resurrection ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ? Where is he and what is he doing? Well, I'll tell you what, he's busy. The Bible says he's ascended on high and he's set down at the right hand of the Father where he ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. You know what that means? He's praying for you and he's praying for me. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven and he's exalted. He sits on the throne. But not only that, because of this, it says that one day I'm going to be exalted. One day I'm going to be Do you realize that if I'm faithful, that one of these days he said I'm going to rule with him? I'm going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. 
Now, for just a minute, I want to I ask you, and I want you to ask yourself the question, where are you? And you say, preacher, you know, I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't feel a need. <laughs> hmm. I think I'm all, all right. I'm not, I'm not cold. Are you hot? Well, preacher, I'm not really on fire for God. You know where that puts you? Luke, warm. Dangerous condition to be in. When you're lukewarm, you don't sense a need. Not only that, he said, I would that you were hot because that'd be enthusiasm. And sometimes you. A person who's lukewarm just doesn't get excited about anything. I'll ask you something. When was the last time you got excited about what God was doing in life? About what he was doing in your church? Could be lukewarm. Hey, Jesus said, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Hey, listen. This is about as serious as it gets. Are you hot? Hey, preacher, not really. Are you cold? No, I'm not that far. What's that in between? Luke, warm. Bow your heads with me. You come on, Brother Herb.